This is a dramatic reading of Can't Buy a Gauge Symmetry, a blog by the stand-up physicist available at science2o.com. Gauge symmetry is a clear direct idea in EM, as I will detail. This property is essential due to redundancies found in the four potential description of light. Any proposal for gravity must also have gauge symmetry. I will show how Lagrangians I have discussed over the last few months uh, do not have that property. <laughs> Therefore, they are wrong. I have altered three titles um, at Science 2.0 and on YouTube to say RETRACTION, Oof. <laughs> including a brief explanation uh, in the description at the start. A different Lagrangian I'm toying with might have a chance, uh, but that will be discussed at another time. Gauge symmetry is like all other symmetries. Find changes that are both real and don't matter. Rotate a circle, and the circle looks the same. Hmm, that's the group S1 for those in the new. Hmm. In EM, one works with the derivatives of potentials. And here is, uh, here that is written out here. Okay, on that top line there. Um, and the vector part is the difference of the magnetic and the electric fields. Oh, what about that first term that shows up there? Uh, I actually avoided calling that a scalar term, as I'm prone to do, because people might think it's invariant under a Lorentz transformation, which is not the case. Mm -mm. No, the first term does not play a role in the EM Lagrangian, so like subtract it away. Hmm. Now that kind of subtraction thingy goes on in, um, in tensor notation too. Um, <clears throat> Now, what is cool about that zero? Well, this is a bit of a speculative idea, but it was it's kind of fun, uh, at least if you're into quaternions. If, if you're into uh, tensor notation, this will sound like an abomination. Mm. Okay, but in the path integral approach to quantum mechanics, uh, the field strength uh, tensor effectively can go upstairs in the exponent of an expo uh, exponential as, uh, as part of the process to form the action. So basically you take del times a um, and then you actually form the reverse of that and then you multiply that all together and you sort of subtract away the um, the three vector there which is turns out to be Poynings vector and you get this uh, you know b squared minus e squared and that is the uh, electric field there. Uh, sorry that's the Lorentz invariant um, thing that goes in into uh, the action. Well, you've got to integrate that uh, over a space-time volume in order to get something that uh, you know is is going to be Lorentz invariant and all that. But it means that instead of just saying, "Well, now that I've got my action, I'll put it upstairs in this exponential," you can say, "Hey, I'll put each one of these up separately, multiply them together, and then boom." But when they're, when they're separate, they've got that zero there. And it turns out that if you got a zero there in a quaternion, then you have SU2 symmetry. And U1 is actually a subgroup of that symmetry. Now, as I say, I don't particularly feel on solid ground uh, reaching up to this exponential cloud, as it were. Um, so just file this under the tentative observation uh, related perhaps to U1 symmetry. So we're going to devise something that can be added uh, to a four potential, uh, but not change those fields, the electric field and the uh, magnetic field. Um, the addition makes the operation a transformation, while the lack of change is what makes it a symmetry. So the first kind of clue is looking at that curl thing, because um, a gradient of a scalar function is like radial change. You know, you got your scalar and you're just going whoosh. And then a curl is like perpendicular to that. So a curl of a gradient of a scalar function is always zero. 
Okay, so that's going to be one of them. And then you notice that you've got some time derivatives going on and you want those to like cancel each other out so that you can add something in and have it not change. So that top line there is the transformation I want to try out. It's got this uh, minus time derivative of uh, uh, with respect to time and a gradient. So you go the gradient. Okay, let's see. That guy goes in with the B field and boom, he gets uh, canceled and bows out of the way. And then we've got uh, these sign differences between these two terms. So it also doesn't change. So the, uh, the B field does not change when you add in this particular field and the E field doesn't change. So that's great. Um, now here is the Lagrangian for EM. It's like, whoa, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's too much in, uh, for video or even, uh, it's just too much. But it's, it's got three parts to it. Uh, one's called the matter uh, Lagrangian, and that's the kinetic energy kind of dude. That's where the uh, one half mv squared is going to uh, show up. Then you have what's called the uh, interaction terms, which is just the uh, the current um, interacting with this potential. And then you have the uh, the free field uh, equations, uh, and you go, whoa, that's a lot of stuff there. Well, you say there's lots of subtractions and stuff. That actually makes things easier. Uh, all those subtractions are about throwing away that first term of the scalar. And then this plus thing is actually, to, it's plus uh, something conjugated, which means it's tossing away the, the vector point at, at that point. Uh, but, but when you get all done at the end of the day, you end up with this uh, b squared minus c squared sort of thing. So the only place uh, the derivatives of the potential actually appear are in the uh, field terms. One uses the Lagrangian to get the force equations, to get the field equations, and to get the stress energy tensor. So what does one do with uh, one's uh, newly proved uh, gauge symmetries? Well, you get to pick a gauge, like, um, like Coulomb's gauge is del dot A equals zero. And you go, well, there's not a del dot A in that Lagrangian. So this is one of these conservation laws by, uh, by omission, which are really important, actually, in physics. Like, uh, we can say that this, this particular Lagrangian is going to be uh, going to conserve energy. Why? Because it doesn't have just a plain old T hanging around. And we're going to say, hey, that actually conserves angular momentum because, well, it doesn't have... Uh, an angle. And it doesn't have an X or a Y sort of thing in there, so it's actually going to uh, conserve linear momentum. So those are all uh, really good things. Um, but those are those are by omission. And the same way there's something called the uh, static gauge, which is d phi dt equals zero, and you go, uh, is there a d phi dt in that Lagrangian? It's like, no. So <laughs> go ahead, pick that gauge, see if I care. Well, why should you care? It's because that um, after you take that Lagrangian and you apply Euler-Lagrange equations to it, then the resulting field equations actually will change by those choices in gauge, and hopefully you'll make it so that the problem is much simpler if you're good at picking gauges. So to say that a Lagrangian is invariant under gauge transformation has three kinds of attributes. Uh, the tentative observation I made regarding that subtraction, leaving that zero in that first driver position of uh, the quaternion expression. Uh, and examples of gauge choices that do not alter the Lagrangian at all. And most importantly, though, is that you have a proof of symmetry under a gauge transformation. That was, I added that field in there, and they all politely bowed out of the way. Now, some will argue rather passionately that only the third issue is of any consequence and the other ones are odd. Mm, okay. Uh, I mentioned the first two because the Lagrangians that I worked with did have those properties. 
Okay. It indicates that I was not totally negle ne negligent uh, to the issue of gauge symmetry. Uh, and two out of three is uh, bad when the uh, third one is really the most important one. So we're going to start down the hypercomplex gravity dead end as before, um, because we're going to define our field equations. And this time I'm using this hypercomplex uh, product and I've got those scalar terms that are the same as before and I say let's get rid of those. Let's toss those out. So we toss them out. Uh, and we have this, this kind of term. And uh, then we're going to say, hmm, what, sh what kind of gauge transformation should I do? And thinking about the, um, the terms we've got there where d phi dt has an opposite uh, I'm sorry, the gradient of phi has an opposite sign of the uh, the time derivative guy. I uh, say, hmm, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll make sure they both have the same sign, so maybe we'll get a cancellation uh, to happen. So then you say, well, does that kind of E field, small E field, does that, uh, is that invariant? It's like, yes, that's very good. Um, and we all have to do is that final term with this uh, symmetric curl, which is what that circle cross is about. And you go, oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> now, big, big pi pi picture people uh, spotted that like long ago. I mean, like a month and a half ago. Um, but I happen to be the lab tech sort. I spent like four or five hours this weekend just trying a variety of gauge transformations. Uh, and I have a few pages of futility. Mm, a good Zen-like practice. Uh, there are so many um, masters that one has to satisfy. You know, there's the field equations, the, the force equations, solutions to both field and force equations um, and that show that, say, like charges attract if you're working with gravity. And, of course, the gauge symmetries themselves. Now, I pondered uh, the lessons swallowed while trying to, to staple a force equation onto my previous work on uh, field theories. And, I mean, I have no problem admitting that I became a desperate man uh, in the comments sections uh, in that Science 2.0 blog, uh, willing to give up all kinds of things like rules of calculus in order to make things work. <laughs> so it goes. Um, but I, I do have one other kind of uh, mandate or criteria um, and that is that the Maxwell equations are just drop-dead gorgeous. And so, should any equations for gravity stand beside those? Well, they must also have that quality. So, while the hypercomplex gravity equations got close, mm, a flaw is a flaw is a flaw by any other name. Now, one of the lessons I learned uh, flopping around like a fish <laughs> on the ground was uh, that the rules of vector calculus are kind of wired into my mind's eye. Um, and I was not able to really see what's called the Z2 cross Z2 uh, uh, symmetry powering these this hyper complex uh, products, uh, which has to do with the Klein four group uh, behind the curtain. And playing with these conjugates uh, in kind of a Z2 way, uh, might be productive. Uh, I have a feeling nature uses it in some uh, creative kind of way that I don't understand yet. Uh, it will have to wait uh, for another week. So here is my snarky puzzle. The oh-so-familiar conjugate operator is the tool of the quaternion Wall Street elite hiding behind a velvet vector dress. The rectangular box world of Z2 cross Z2 prefers to be divided in twos. Hmm. So doodle with these. Let's let the Z2 conjugate, star i, star j, and star k, do two sign flips and form the following products. Hmm. And just for fun, and I mean only fun, <laughs> take the sum. Thank you very much.